I'm going to read from Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 14. And if at any moment during this message you feel to begin to weep, you begin to cry, I, I, I implore you and I beg you, please to do that. We'll stop and we'll pray in the Holy Ghost. Because I'm not trying to get to a place today. I feel we're already there in the Spirit. Where we are right now is where I'm always trying to get to by the end of a sermon. Well, we're already there. And so I'm going to release this word today, and I want you to respond to it. The altars are not going to be opened. They are already open because they never close. So when you feel anything, I want you to respond to it. And I believe we're going to break into a deeper atmosphere than the one we were just in. Because his word pulls us even further into it. Amen? If you remain standing, I'm going to read from Genesis, or Galatians rather, chapter 3, verse 10. It says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, and he quotes an Old Testament scripture, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous, he quotes, shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, he quotes again, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Some random, strange Levitical law that none of these Jews quite understood. What does that mean? Cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. This random law who seems like it didn't apply to anybody would be just held in reserve for somebody in the future. So that in Christ Jesus... The blessing of his name, Abraham, means father of a multitude. So let's read it as it is. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of the father with a lot of kids might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Abraham would be the carbon copy of what God was, a father with many kids, not just the Jews. Because God told Abraham, I'm going to bless the Gentiles through you as well. You're going to have sons and daughters of every ethnicity, every nation, every tongue. But to do that, they can't do it through a law. The law is not going to get my sons and daughters back. It's going to be a curse that does. And so I want to minister cursed ground. Now, if we can pray just for a moment, and then we'll be seated. Father, I thank you for the moving of your sweet spirit that's here in this room. I pray, Almighty God, that the heaviness I've been feeling on me since the day you gave me this word last Friday, I pray that it would continue to be heavy on me. God, I don't feel a release from this word, and I'll preach it as many times as you want me to until the church hears it. So, God, I'm going to minister it today to this beautiful body of believers today, God. This group of people, your sons, your daughters, your bride. Father, I pray that it would provoke us. It would challenge us. Call us deeper to you, God. In your name, I'll give you the praise. Whatever Whatever you do today, God, whatever you are in this place, you and you alone will be the one who gets glory. Any compliment that comes our way, Lord, we'll deflect it and point it back to heaven from whence it came. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Brother Clark, this passage uses a particular word five times within the span of five verses. It's a word that carries such negative baggage with it that it has become associated with the idea of being an unmentionable hush, hush word. Cursed. For us, to curse means to use some vile four-lettered speech that is not mentioned in the presence of a child. Speech that would make the pure blush and even the righteous cringe. This word, if it's personified, evokes the image of a haggard, stringy-haired witch casting a hex upon a poor victim with some form of dark magic. Or it could simply be used to describe the type of day you're having when the day results in some calamity, some heartache, or even trouble. You would call it, this is a cursed day. The idea of vile four-lettered words, witches, and troublesome days just doesn't quite line up with what we have come to desire from church where we expect the divine God, creator of all that is good, to show up. A holy God will not, should not, cannot abide in a cursed context. So consequently, curse has then become a word rarely spoken within the sanctimonious entities of churches nowadays. 
And I'm afraid that in our politically correct modern era of striving to generate a more tolerable gospel that is kinder to the sensibilities of tithe-paying patrons to the house of God, we have thus reduced the gospel to a G-rated version. In so doing, we have muted to near obscurity the absolute necessity of understanding the weight and brevity of what the Bible has to say concerning a curse. Paul was not willing to stray away from this word. He would want the full weight to rest upon the shoulders of all who resided in the church of Galatia. But for Paul, curse did not carry with it the baggage of four-lettered vile words that make the righteous blush. He wasn't thinking of witches and hexes and dark magic. His theology of the curse would be as old as time itself, tracing its origins all the way back to the fall of humanity. Because the first time that this word curse is mentioned in your holy Bible, we rarely think of our book, this book right here, as a cursed book. We often think of it as a holy book. And it is a holy book, but it's written to a cursed generation. The sooner we can realize that, then the more holy than this book will become in our own minds. But this curse is first mentioned to us in Genesis 3, 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall inflame, is what it says in Hebrew, all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Essentially, it's put this way. Somebody's going to put his foot down someday and it's going to hurt him. Because when you put your foot down to things, it always hurts. We often brag about the crushing aspect of putting the foot down, but we rarely talk about the cursed context of it, that when you put your foot down, it's always going to hurt. Because you're going to receive a bruise. And to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Paul, so that you don't get offended by this beautiful book we call the Bible. In the garden, the perfect Edenic place, man's strength meant nothing there because there were no thorns and thistles. All man had to do was just go and spread the dirt out, drop a seed, God send the rain, and it manifested fruit. Man's strength meant nothing over woman's smaller, weaker frame because everyone in the Edenic society was equal. But when you're under a curse, man will now try to use his strength to overpower woman. This is a cursed context. And now woman, because she is made from lesser weight, she cannot overpower man. And so now we're living in a fallen contextual world where there is a curse alive. And a godly man will not try to use his authority and strength to domineer, but rather go back to Eden. God is not talking about how things should be. He's talking about how things now are because of a curse. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground, hear this, because of you. God's not doling out curses because he's a cruel daddy. He's looking at us and he says, this is not how I designed any of this. This is not the way I hardwired it. This is not the way it is in my house. But the house you have chosen is a cursed house. This is a dying, decaying world that you're now creating. I created a good world full of life. You notice that it was okay to be naked in the garden because in my world there's no lust. And I can look upon my children who are naked because there's no lust in my eyes. But now that you live in a fallen world where there's decay and death and dying and, and filthiness and vileness all around you, you're going to have to be clothed because there's lust in this dying, decaying world. And the ground is reaping... The curse because of you, Adam. This good ground that all you had to do was spread the dirt, drop a seed, I send the rain, and there would be a fruit tree there. The, you didn't have to do any work. Your strength meant nothing there. Everyone's equal in this place. Not anymore. The ground is cursed. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you're going to return. The result of an angelic being as well as mankind using their gift of self-will for rebellion against God's word, a curse is released. 
The curse is not because of God. It's because of us. This is not the way I created things. All I made was good, is good. My calling of being fruitful and multiplying, the job I gave you, the calling I placed on you of fruitfulness and multiplication, it was good. But now because of your gross misuse of your will, multiplication through childbirth is now cursed. And fruitfulness that I I asked that you would participate with, it's now cursed. Woman, your multiplication is going to be painful. Man, your fruitfulness is going to now be a lot of work and it's going to be painful. There is a curse. The ground or Adama in Hebrew is what man was made from. That's why the Bible calls him Adam because from it's the Aduma he came from. And God looks at him and he says these words. He says, now that you have done this, if the ground is cursed, if the Aduma is cursed, what do we expect from the Adam? Your soil is now cursed, Adam. And now living under this curse, no longer in the Edenic society, in the ideal place. Now, Adam, when you die... The place where you came from is where you'll go back to. Because you're not living in the rightful place, which was the spirit place. The place of my presence. Curse. It will produce blood, inducing thorns. The word for thistle in Hebrew means useless weed. If you look at an ancient Near Eastern weed, it looks like fruit. It should bear fruit, but it's useless. You crack it open with hope and there's nothing inside. Useless. Blood inducing, weeds that look like they should bring forth fruit, but all they bring forth is aggravation. Worse than this, though, now every time you hear your own name, you're going to think of your own destiny. To ground you'll return. And I imagine that in this context, they began to feel the breath of God that they once felt breathe into them the Spirit. It's now breathing forth the reality of a curse they introduced into the world. This creation that was good is now decaying. The breathing curse of reality settles upon them. The distortion of a rebellious people now curse. These cursed words would undoubtedly bring heaviness into the air, but the sting of the curse was not yet fulfilled. It wasn't given fully. The sting of the curse was fully felt when Genesis 3.22, where God says, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil, and he's not mature enough to handle, he's not wise enough to handle the knowledge of good and evil. This revelation that he had at infancy will now crush him. He doesn't know what to do because he hasn't bore any fruit yet. Only fruitful people can handle knowledge. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden. And this is when the sting of the curse was felt. I can manage the pain of thorns and thistles. I can deal with the hurt of bringing forth a baby. But you're meaning to tell us there's more to it, God? And God would look at them and say, yes, I'm sorry. What comes along with this rebellion is the absence of me. And that was the crushing reality that would settle upon mankind. Cast them out of the garden to work the ground from which he was taken. And he drove out the man and east of the garden of Eden. He placed cherubim and a flaming sword. And it turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. As the doorway to the eternal spiritual sanctum where the loving creator resides slams shut. My mind could not help but hear the first cries of the Bible as Adam and Eve are out there and they're saying God we could deal with everything else I could deal with thorns I could deal with thistles I could deal with pain in my body through childbearing but God this is unbearable being outside your presence is too heavy for me what kind of a loving father shuts the door to the spirit realm the home What kind of God does that? A gracious one. Because God looked upon his children and said, you're cursed now. You brought the curse. And if you eat from the other tree of life, you'll live cursed forever. And I love you way too much. I knew it was a gamble when I made you like me with a wheel. I knew it was a gamble, but I had you anyway knowing you might walk away because not having you at all was a pain I couldn't bear. 
And so I chose to make you with a wheel, knowing there's the chance you might walk away. But principalities and devils and hell don't know that I've got a plan for this gamble. I've already made up my mind to die, even at the beginning. But right now, this door is shut. It's not locked, it's shut. And this is what the Lord does. Lo, I stand at the door. But you hear me close, church. This is what I know about doors. Sodom and Gomorrah was trying to get through a door to get to the heavenly, those angelic beings. And as they're looking for the door, they were full of carnality under the curse. And those angels reached out and blinded them that the Bible said they could not find the door. God stands there and he's a perfect gentleman and he knocks. He waits on somebody to get some sense to themselves and say, I don't want to live out here in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's safer in there. The door is available to every child of God, but we live under a carnal curse. One could manage the curse of pain as we bring forth children because of the joy that a child brings. I can deal with the pain of childbearing because I at least get a baby out of it. And man could say, I can deal with thorns and thistles because I will get fruit from it. It's going to require some sweat and some work, but I cannot bear not seeing your face. I don't like this part of the curse, God. Out here in this world under the influence of a curse, beyond that door, we are separated from His face. And worse, when we die, eternally separated. For from dust we were formed, to dust we return. Unless we can somehow get back through that door and find that tree of life again. Our only destiny is to live and die this way. And what's burdened me is I've asked the Lord a lot about this passage. And we as Americans have gotten really good at managing the curse. Many men don't work by the sweat of their brow. We found out we can make money by other means. And so the curse doesn't affect us. We've become somewhat like God's. Women, we can have an epidural and we don't have to deal with the pain. And I'm thankful for technology. I'm thankful for all of this. Please don't misunderstand me. But what I've felt is we've learned how to manage the curse. And so managing the sweat of the brow, the thorns and the thistles, and the pain of childbearing, we have also managed the separation. And I'm faced with this spirit every week that we've learned really well how to be entertained intoxicated so I don't need his presence I'm blessed I'm happy I'm happier than I've ever been my happiness is not the deciding factor if I'm doing well my blessings I don't look at my blessings and say well look I'm clearly favored Israel when they were their most far from God is when they were most blessed Judas got paid and didn't have Jesus Blessings don't equate relationship. His presence and feeling that holy witness in your prayer time and feeling that presence of God and His face shining upon you. That's what I'm looking for. I don't want to manage. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that we can work and not have to do it by the sweat of our brow. That's, that's us journeying back to Eden, Brother Weedner. I'm thankful that our ladies don't have to endure pain. I'm thankful that my wife, who should have died with the birth of our first son, didn't die because of modern medicine. I'm thankful for all of that. I'm thankful that we've learned through modern medicine and God has given us wisdom on how to do it, but not at the expense of being God. Like, Just because we can manage a curse doesn't mean I should be able to manage separation. We of all people should have a revelation of separation. We brag about separation. We post about it. We say that we're better than every denomination as Pentecostals because of our separation. So much to the point that we've gotten elevated in pride. That we've become separated from the one we were trying to be separate to. Because we're not as spiritual as we once were. Out here in this world under the influence of the curse beyond that door. We're separated from his face. And in this looming depravity it's tremendously hard to see where that grace is. But a gracious God said I didn't design you to live under that curse. And I didn't design you to manage it either. Why then was I cast from your face, God? Well, the prophet tells us, you who are of pure eyes, talking about God, than to see evil, you cannot look at wrong. 
God is too holy, His eyes too sanctimonious to look at you in your curse. That's why He closes the door and He said, My holiness cannot look upon them, but I'll knock. And I will wait. I will intercede on behalf of my people. I'll send them a gift, the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost comes upon them, then they can come and we can be together because without me, they're not holy enough to be with me. The law that you're living by doesn't make you holy. Your extended fasting doesn't make you holy. Your shirt length doesn't make you holy. Your hair length doesn't make you holy. His Spirit makes you holy. Telling everyone about us, bragging on us, evidently that's a blessing. Who would give that up? Who would turn away 5,000? Who would go up to a mountain alone to pray? Evidently there was a blessing beyond God's mind that, ma- that surpassed numbers. That surpassed feel-good moments. That surpassed good sermons. There was something else on his mind that he would deem a blessing. He would say something that would remind all of his Jewish listeners of the malediction, the anathema, the curse that we introduced. He would say this in John 8. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away. You will seek me. And some of you are going to die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jewish people said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. Carnal people can't understand spiritual concepts, unfortunately. Paul said it. Those which are carnal cannot understand spiritual things. This frustrates me sometimes when preaching because people look at me like I have four heads. And I look at them and say, are you not reading the same book I'm reading? I'm no different than you. I have no more Holy Ghost than you have. The only thing that's different is I come across people who are hungry. And unfortunately, I come across the same people who are filled, but not with God's hunger. He said to them, you are from beneath. Adomah is where you came from, but not me. I'm from above. You are of this world. Not me, though. I'm not of this world. Go ahead. Go ahead. Make fun of people for being spiritual. You spit in the face of God when you do. Because he didn't mind being spiritual because he looked at people and he said, you're of this world, not me. I'm heavenly minded. Go ahead, make fun of somebody for being so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. Clearly being heavenly minded leads to earthly good though according to Jesus. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, capital he, who is he? You will die in your sins. He was clearly a personal pronoun of someone who said was to come. I believe it's pretty clear. Emmanuel, God with us. The ground is cursed, human, Adam. And from dust you came and to the dust you're going to return because you're from beneath. Unless you believe on me. But the work of this blessed servant wasn't over. If he entered the door through a curse, then we should expect him to leave through one. Sure enough, one, this cursed God, this one God, on the eve of his life here on earth, Jesus would set down the blessings of this life and take up the curse that we created. He would start his descent as he would go back to the garden. There he would do the work in the spirit so laborious that he would sweat as it was great drops of blood onto the ground. Do you see this? He said, I came through a curse. I'm going to leave through the same curse. The ground has been cursed because of you. And he goes back to the garden and he hits his knees. (laughs) And he begins to not take a backhoe. 
He doesn't take a shovel. He doesn't do any of this stuff. He begins to intercede. He gets spiritual. And he begins to intercede on behalf of cursed humans. And he begins to take upon himself. And he begins to feel the weight of curse. The Holy One, who was too holy to look upon sin, would make this statement, put it all on me. I'm too holy to look at it, but I'm not too good to to have it put on me. And he begins to work the soil. And as he's working the ground and sweat is dropping, the curse, he's fulfilling the curse. He looks at us and said, you were supposed to work this ground by the sweat of your brow. You weren't doing it. So I'm going to replace your heart with a heart of stone and replace it with flesh. The ground was us. We were the ground. We were the curse one. He was weeding the garden right there in the spirit through spiritual warfare and intercession. And he said, this ground, it's too hard. I can't plant anything here. This isn't good soil. Hopefully they've been listening to my parables about good and and bad soil. So what can I do? How can I fix this soil, this curse? Here's what I'll do. I will sweat great drops of my own blood on it. That should soften the soil. That should make it soft enough. That should tenderize them enough. That should make them want me, right? Right? Surely they'll want to see my face because of this. I'm doing what they can't do. Maybe, Maybe that'll make them want me. But I'm still dealing with that wheel of theirs. But here's what I'll do. Not having them is a burden I can't bear. So I'll suffer. I'll die even if you don't choose me. Because not having you is too much to bear. Not having you is a pain far greater than what I'm about to endure. So here, I'll soften the ground. Maybe they'll see how much I love them. Maybe they'll turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. Then I can heal their ground. But some still may not. He would then walk as he pulverizes the dirt. He goes and he looks at him and he says, I know the next part, thorns and thistles. I know that part. I know blood-inducing thorns. I know useless, fruitless thistles. But I'm a king, but I'm not above curse. I'm a cursed king. Bring those thorns, those blood-inducing, fruit-choking thorns. Put them on my head. Crown me with the curse. I'll be the king of the curse. And they press it upon his head. And there would be blood that would roll down that brow that sweat onto the ground. And he would say, okay, I came in through the curse. I'll leave. I came in through woman's curse. That's the only way I can heal it. I'll leave through man's. And so they did. They hung him from a cross. And right there, every Jew who knew their Bibles would look at him. And they'd say, I thought that was Emmanuel. I thought that was God with us. But according to the law... Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I need to stick to the law. Surely that's not the will of God. Because according to the law, that's a curse. And God Almighty would be up there and he said, exactly. Exactly. And cursed is everyone who lives by the law. That's why I'm above the law and I'm taking your curse on me. But you, you must see this next part. If the benediction prayer is, may he make his face shine upon me. May his countenance fall upon me. May I feel his peace. Then you must see this next part clearer than you've ever seen it because it hit me like a ton of bricks. I have never fallen more in love with the cross, Brother Clark, until I read this. That as Christ hung from that cross, he cried out those words as he felt the weight of them. He felt as if God turned his face away from him. And he took upon himself the weight that you and I would have to feel otherwise. Where he looks at us and turns us away and says, you cannot come in here unless you depart from iniquity. Depart from me, worker of iniquity, I never knew you. He took that on himself so that he doesn't have to hear that cry on the other side of a door ever again. I will say it and I'll feel it. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? 
In that moment, the son, who was also the father, had to feel the weight and brevity of a father turning his face away. And literally in that moment, the sun stopped shining on him. The sun, darkness covered the land, totally hopeless and abandoned. He felt that. Can you feel that, though? Do you sit with that, or are you managing separation? This reality has come upon me that I don't want to be separated from him by what he did for me. I do not want to hear those words depart from me. And I don't want to be on the other side of a pearly gate saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To dust you shall return. I stood at this door and knocked. I came through the impossible door. I left through an impossible door. What did you need from me? What more could I have done? This is why Paul says it clearly. When you continue in sin, you openly crucify him all over again. You understand the weight of what we do when we haphazardly live our lives doing whatever we want to do, thinking whatever we want to think, looking at whatever we want to think of? We send him back to the cross over and over again. And it hurts my soul to do it to him, the one who died for me. But here, I'm not here to talk about the curse. Even though we still are born into sin, we're shaped by iniquity, we're distorted. This is what he did. Watch this, you can't miss this. As they took that lifeless body from the cross, Sister Gina, and there was no more hope in the world. Hope died. Hope is gone. There's no peace. It's total darkness. We're hopeless. We're abandoned. We're forsaken. They took his body from the cross. And I'm thankful for people who pursue crosses and bodies. They took his body and they felt his blood on them. They buried him in a tomb and that was it. I know all of hell through a party. We got him. Here, this is what we'll do. Could you imagine the strategies of hell? Could you imagine it? Here's what we'll tell every person from now on. If God's son can be forsaken and abandoned and they heard him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We'll use that to destroy every human now. God doesn't even love his own. Why would he love you? All right, draw up the battle plans. This is how we'll destroy every human. This is what we wanted to begin with. Let's manipulate and warp and destroy every human from here on out. All right, here, pop off the bottle cap on the wine. Let's drink ourselves drunk and celebrate the one who was forsaken because now no one has hope. And as they celebrated, God, who was knocking on our door, knocked on Curse's door. And opened it up. And you got to understand what hell is in Jewish theology. It's the land of the dead. It's Sheol. He went down to the land of the dead. Where everybody who was dead went back to dust. He went there. That's where he went. He went to the place where everybody returned to dust. And he went down there. And he said, none of you got to hear the gospel. None of you got to hear the death, the burial, the resurrection. You died under the law. You died cursed. Move out of the way, hell. I'm going to build my church here, right here in the land of the dead. When I prophesied that upon this rock, I'll build my church. By the way, you know what that rock was? It was Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the place where demons were cast down in the Old Testament. And he said, here I am. The gates of hell can't prevail. Step aside. You're silenced now, accuser. And he stood up and he preached to dirt. And the Old Testament prophecy of the prophet, and he said, can these bones live? He said, God, thou knowest. He said, prophesy, son of man. And as a wind came through, dead bodies started rising up. And bone began to snap to bone, and sinew began to grow. And that's what was taking place when God Almighty went down there. You know why he could do this? It went back to the original curse. Hear this close and hear it good. Where hell messed up tremendously was they forgot to calculate into the gospel the fact that man was made from dust. Woman wasn't. (laughs) Woman was made from. She didn't have no dust in her. She was bone. And according to the prophecy, no bones in the body of Christ can be broken. And so his daddy wasn't dust. He had no earthly father. 
Heavenly Father, Spirit overshadowed Mary, and she became pregnant with that one. So he could say, I'm from above, not below. My daddy's not dirt. Mm. I don't feel like that hits you the way it hit me. That as they took that body... And every person in the whole region of Judea and all of Samaria, they could imagine his body decomposing, going back to dust. They know, they know the process. They knew what would happen. Here, do you know what they would do in ancient times? They would take bodies, bury them in a tomb, and they would wait for the body to go to dust. And they would go and collect the bones, and they'd put the bones inside the bones of a sepulcher with all their family members. And that's what they were expecting. By the way, that's what the the dead bury the dead means. They're called gravers. He says, let the gravers do their job. Their job is to go and collect bones and put them with their, their family members. And so when he says, let the dead bury the dead, let the gravers do their job. We don't do that in the kingdom. Hear me, hear me, hear me. There's no gravers. Nobody collects these bones because... I'm going to do something. There's no bone. There's no, there's no dust in me. There's only spirit. So I don't go back to dust. And so Jesus could walk down to the land of the dead, to Sheol, and he could go and he could preach a message, and hell couldn't say a word. As he gets up there and he preaches his own death, his own burial, his own resurrection, and just like on day three of creation, a tree was born, on day three he resurrects out the tree of life. And here's what happens. Go read it in Matthew a bunch of people start popping out of the grave. What's that all about? The wind of Pentecost started blowing over dead bodies and somebody in hell said, hey, can these people who died under the old covenant live? He said, absolutely they can live because I live and if I live, you can live. You're not under the curse anymore. You have hope today. You see this fatal mistake, stand, stand when the musicians come. That fatal mistake was, oh, if we kill him, all hope is gone. Oh, he, they, we're all going to be forsaken. And he said, no, 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 no. Here's what I'm going to do for them. If they will be born again, <laughs> if they will be born again, if they'll put all their faith in what I'm about to do. What did he do? He died. And he said, I'm not from down here, I'm from up there. And when I die, I don't go there, I go there. I go back to the place from whence I came. And here's what will happen if you do the same. Someday, a trumpet's going to sound. And I'm not coming back through the curse. Notice his return is not coming through a womb. His return is coming through eastern skies being split. You know what that tells us? That is a prophecy right there in and of itself. And we can exegete and preach that all day long. Just the eastern sky splitting open. That alone tells us the curse is done. Because if we're still under the curse, Jesus' second coming would still be through birth. And so what does God require of us to get to him? He says, the way I came in is through the curse. And so are you. You're going to have to be born again. Of water and there's no dust in you. There's no dirt in you. When the Spirit overshadows you the way it did Mary, something will be birthed inside of you. And it will be a seed that's going to grow into the fullness and into the maturity of what I've called you. And you're going to grow daily into my image. Under still this cursed world. And this is why, hear this, 1 Corinthians 15 says, The first man was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. (laughs) And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not sleep. Here, sleep meant when you died. We're not going to stay dirt, he said, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet's going to sound, and the dead, the dead, 
do you still believe this good news? Do you imagine how good this news was? That I don't have to die eternally separated. Here's what we've done about hell. We've made hell an inconvenience. Oh, it's where the flame is never quenched and the canker worm. And I'm going to be tormented all my life. That's all about you, 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 you. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I don't want to be separated from him. I don't, I'm not highlighting the inconvenience of hell. I'm highlighting the separation of hell. God, cast me not away from you. God, that's what David prayed when he sinned. Against you and you alone have I sinned. Cast me not out of thy presence. That's true repentance. So across this room, I want people to raise their hands. And I want weeping right now. Here, get the weight that some of us, if we don't repent, will be separated. Who can manage that? Repent right now, all of us. Be clothed with the Spirit. Come on, pray, pray, pray. I'd be praying a lot more than that if I had the revelation that I was under a curse and I had the potential of being separated from Him. Does this not convict you? What more do you need? Christ died. I have nothing else to offer you other than Christ and Him crucified. That's all I have. I have no one trick pony. I've got no more tricks for you. Here, your hunger, cry out to the one, the only one. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, I would do it today. I would not wait. If there's no water in the baptistry, I'd go find a bathtub. I would do whatever I had to do so that the dust could hold his image. I would go get baptized in his name and I'd want his holy name put on me. If I've never been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence of speaking in tongues, I'd do it right now. If I have made any mistakes in the past 24 hours, I would pray the prayer of David against you and you alone have I sinned. Cast me not out of thy presence. And here's the promise. While we live under grace, he is still saying, come one, come all, come into my presence. Now run after his presence. Run to these altars if you feel it. But I would be praying in the spirit. Whatever I did right now, I'd be praying in the Holy Ghost.